As mentioned earlier, I'm Dave Terry with uh, Media Current. Those I haven't met before, I'm a partner at uh, Media Current. We're pretty hardcore Drupal development shop uh, in Alpharetta. And I'm going to let the panel kind of introduce themselves and uh, go into their kind of background. Uh, my name is Paul McKibben. I'm a principal at Digital Valence, a software developer. Uh, Digital Valence uh, uses Drupal in about half of the solutions they provide for their clients. Therefore, about half of my work is Drupal. I, I consider myself a, an advanced Drupal user. Uh, I'm Bill Shawey. I'm uh, an IT architect from IBM here in Atlanta. I've been active in Drupal for three years. Uh, several different projects in Drupal. Um, strong in back end, weak in front end. Uh, and I'm Kent Lester. I'm one of the co-founders of the Atlanta Drupal Users Group. Uh, I'm an author, and I got into Drupal several years ago to try to supplement my writing work and uh, build my own websites, and I got into it more and more, and the deeper I got into it, the more I liked it, and so here we are today. I'm probably an intermediate to advanced. I'm getting there. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't entertain the advanced part quite yet. Um, so a couple of announcements. Um, Paul and Ray, um, just so you guys know, hold a um, workshop, Drupal workshop, um, the third Tuesday of every month. And it's um, down at a co-working space called Ignition Allen. And it's, what do you say, Decatur? Or kind of it's, mid it's Midtown. Midtown yeah. It's uh, Ponte Island, I guess. Yeah. It's so, near, the, uh, near City Hall East. You know where City Hall East is. So we normally have kind of a... Um, topic that we will present on uh, during this meeting and then at the workshop they'll kind of pick up on the subject there and it's a little more hands-on. There's not a, a slides or any kind of formal presentation but we basically apply what we talked about um, here down at the workshop. Um, heard somebody mention Drupal Camp Atlanta. Um, give you guys a heads up. We had our first planning meeting um, today and we want to pencil in a date. This is tentative. It's probably going to be October 2nd if you're trying to plan around any vacations or anything. Um, that's a, that's, Don't go anywhere. Yeah, yeah, Saturday. You don't want to miss Triple Camp Atlanta. Um, but the, the website should hopefully be up in um, you know, probably six or seven weeks. We'll, uh, we'll do a lot of announcements. but. I definitely would recommend signing up early. We sold out last year about two months in advance, so um, there's definitely a cap to the amount of uh, attendees that the um, venue can handle. <laughs> um, remind everybody, I've kind of got my hand slapped um, last month with trash. If you can just make sure that you pick up after yourself before you leave, push in your chair. Um, Matrix, they're my, the staff's nice enough to kind of stay late, um, and we don't want to abuse our privilege. They also provide all the pizza and beverages and stuff, so if you could just pick up after yourself when, you know, before you leave. Um, today, the, we are going to be talking um, about DrupalCampCon. Um, DrupalCon's the twice um, yearly event, one in North America and one in Europe that Drupal has. Um, we just all these guys attended a couple weeks ago. Um, our goal kind of here today is to catch you up on what is going on in the Drupal community and kind of some of the um, latest and greatest happenings. So um, we're going to keep it pretty, um, again, informal. If you guys have questions uh, that you want to ask them, feel free to chime in. And um, I've got some prepared questions as well that uh, I'm going to ask. So. With that said, I think what's kind of on the mind of everybody is Drupal 7. And um, when is it going to be kind of officially released? And what did you guys kind of take away from the conference on Drupal 7? And what can you kind of tell us about the, the release? Paul, well, you want to take Sure. <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> I actually did. Uh, did not attend very many Drupal 7 related sessions this time around because I attended a bunch of them six months ago in, in Paris. Uh, but as far as like when I think Drupal 7 will be ready, uh, the, most of the, the pundits seem to be predicting somewhere around June or July now. 
Uh, I was helping with the code sprint, and I, at that time, I think they had 90 some odd critical issues. Last I checked, about a week ago, it's down to 80 some odd critical issues. Uh, that number of critical issues, I believe, needs to get down to zero before they'll release it. So um, they've got a ways to go yet. I don't know if you guys want to chime in on your Well, I, I remember Dries uh, spoke to that in his presentation, um, and he, he listed June as being the optimistic day in probably October. September to October as being the worst case scenario. So just knowing the enthusiasm that I saw there, the, the uh, DrupalCon, I would expect maybe July or August would be my guess. I will I add, um, I went to a presentation by a company called Palantir who's big in the Drupal community and they said they are actually using Drupal 7 right now for sites that they expect to launch in the third and fourth quarter of this year, which I thought was very interesting. They have that much confidence in Drupal 7, even as it is now, that they're willing to do that. Uh, the, the biggest thing that I've noticed is that they're still working on some of the critical areas of Drupal 7 that impact some of the other modules. So if someone has a, a pretty standard site that's going to work with mainly Drupal core and isn't going to use too many of the other modules, I think you could probably start working with it today in a development environment. Uh, but some of the more important modules like views and the media module and some of these other ones are so tightly integrated into the changes that have been made in Drupal 7 that I think it's going to be, if, if you really depend on those heavyweight modules, then probably another few months before it'll really be stabilized enough. I know uh, one, one of the sessions that I went to on the media module, which is going to be a, a, a big addition to Drupal 7, they were changing the media module during the session <laughs> to fix problems that had occurred the night before because someone had changed something in Drupal 7 that impacted that module. So I think the, the, the biggest problem with Drupal 7 right now is with the other modules that integrate with it rather than the core itself. Probably the other big problem is if you need to upgrade a site to Drupal 7. I think a lot of the upgrade paths haven't really been worked out yet. Right. I've written um, some high-level takeaways from uh, Grace's presentation um, <clears throat> pertaining to Drupal 7. So. Uh, I'm going to uh, break the cardinal rule of uh, public speaking and look down at my notes <laughs> as, I, as I speak. But this, these are the notes I, I've taken from the notes. Um, yeah, probably the biggest thing about Drupal 7 is fields. That is, taking CCK and breaking it up and taking big pieces of CCK functionality, moving it into core, where you can assign fields not only to nodes, but to anything, to a user profile, to uh, comments to, to, to really anything. So that really changes the paradigm of, of this, especially developing custom modules. That's probably the biggest thing. Um, but other big things with Drupal 7 is there's a lot of semantic web functionality built into Drupal 7 that didn't exist before or only existed in third-party plugin modules. Um, so out of the box, um, a lot of what you create in Drupal 7 automatically gets RDFA tags surrounded, surrounding it. So nodes, the fields inside nodes, uh, all automatically get RDFA. And thus is searchable um, using the semantic web Sparkle um, from the rest of the, rest of the web. So your, your Drupal site is automatically out of the box without any work on your part. Much more search engine optimized than a non-Drupal site. Um, what else? Ah, um, integration with other databases other than MySQL uh, was a big deal, particularly large, high-scaling databases. Um, NoSQL, um, CouchDB, MongoDB, Cassandra um, will all have some degree of uh, uh, drivers for Drupal 7. Uh, also, Microsoft has been doing work with, um, I don't remember who, it could have been Aquia. Commerce Guys. Was it Commerce Guys? Mm -hmm. To create a PDO driver for, for um, Microsoft SQL Server, which is a big deal. Um, Did you have an Oracle at all? Do you need the bot design and MySQL? I don't remember. Do you guys remember? Nope. Nobody's mentioned Oracle. That's a 
Yeah. But I would think <laughs> that because of the, the way that Drupal is supposed to interface with PDO in Drupal 7, that that would naturally extend to many databases, including Oracle. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was also a fair amount of interest in uh, another MySQL project called Drizzle, which is basically a, a down-developed version of MySQL that's supposed to be optimized for web presentation. So they've taken a lot of the transactional and, and other uh, features of MySQL and they've stripped that out and, and they tried to go with a bare-bones MySQL type database server that is optimized just for serving web pages has a lot of the cruft of MySQL taken out of it. And so I heard quite a bit of interest in Drizzle as a, a future project. And since Drupal is now pretty much database agnostic, these types of opportunities I think are going to come up a lot more often now because it's really not going to be that hard of a, a, a process to integrate a database in there. Just to back up to what Bill said, is there, he mentioned RDFA. Is everybody familiar with what that is? Or, <coughs> no. We, do you want to maybe kind of yeah, you're the, that? You're the RDFA. Well, yeah, I, did, I, did, I did a talk at last year's Drupal <laughs> Camp on RDFA. That was a real point of emphasis, though, in 7 and at the conference. So. Right. It, the high-level definition of uh, semantic web, of which RDA is a component of, is uh, reimagining the web as one gigantic database where um, instead of searching for web pages and getting web page results back in a search engine you are getting either pieces of web pages or whole web pages or groupings of web pages the, the, the boundaries around content that boundary being a web page suddenly gets shattered um, so instead of marking up an entire web page for search you're marking up the author you're marking up a location mentioned. You're, you're, you're marking up uh, a, a person's name mentioned. Uh, you're, you're, you're marking up a relationship between two people uh, from two different web pages. So um, semantic web technology enables all of this. And moreover, um, that markup can happen not only by a developer actually writing markup around pieces of a web page, but markup happening automatically machine-generated markup, and, and this is where Drupal is really taking the lead um, among most other technologies. Drupal is one of the very first technologies to automatically mark up content out of the box. So this is a very, very exciting development. Uh, Dries has been hammering on this almost since the creation of Drupal several years ago. RDFA, which is a semantic web technology, is actually kind of old. It's been around for a long time. Um, and, and Dries has known about it for a long time, but now the Drupal community has really, really started getting active in it. A lot of great modules for Drupal 6 that do it, and now it's going to be native to Drupal 7, so it's it's going to happen whether we like it or not. And Bill, isn't um, isn't Google already starting to give precedence <coughs> to websites that have RDFA embedded yes. in there? So. Uh, that is the exciting part to me because that means that with a Drupal 7 website, you're coming out right out of the box with a system that is going to be rated more highly than competing websites before you even have to do anything to it uh, in terms of SEO. So that's pretty exciting to me. Anybody else have any questions on Drupal 7 before we move on? Okay. Um, did you guys have a kind of aha moment on a session you sat in on? A cool tip or new trick that you picked up on that you could maybe share? Well, um, not any single aha moment. I kind of went with an agenda. Um, since I'm part of a company where we have Drupal sites built by multiple developers, and you know, some, some of you may have run into this if you've had to cooperate with others on developing a Drupal site. Um, it's very hard to manage the contributions of multiple people in building a Drupal site in a way that uh, you can put them together and deploy them cleanly without running into each other and, and causing problems. I, I call this the deployment problem. You've got a bunch of developers developing on their own workstations. You merge it with a development server. Then you might have a staging server and a production server. 
production server might have something live on it and you need to change it, so you make changes on your development environment. And it, it becomes very complicated on how to move this stuff around. Um, so there, uh, there were a lot of little things that I learned at DrupalCon to help solve this problem, but I also came away knowing that Drupal really hasn't solved this yet. Um, uh, Dries Keynote actually mentioned this problem as something that they want to focus on in Drupal 8. Um, but some of the things that I came away with that will help, uh, some of you may have been here last month when uh, Jane Sansbury did a, pro uh, a presentation on features. Uh, the features uh, module uh, and the idea of thinking in terms of features will help with this in some respects, but it doesn't cover all functionality of Drupal. Um, part of the problem is that Drupal mixes content and configuration in its database. And if you can somehow separate the configuration from the content, it becomes a lot easier to manage people's contributions, merge them, and deploy them without having to worry about stepping on each other or, or trying to figure out what changes are content and what changes are configuration. Uh, so some of the ideas that came out of that are doing as much in code as possible. Um, instead of creating a block in the GUI, uh, write a custom module and use hook block to create your block. Um, let's see what else I've got in here from, from that, because I took tons and tons of notes. Uh, there's an exportables uh, in Ctools, exportables module in Ctools that you can use to declare certain kinds of data as exportable so that you can export it, like you can export views or export your content types. You can use this exportables interface to make your own module exportable and the data that your module creates exportable so that you can take what it creates and move it to another site. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find my list again here. Uh, there's a deploy module that is in development right now but looks promising. Uh, the deploy module uh, allows you to select content in your development or staging site to deploy to an existing production site in a way that is clean and is not going to screw things up. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple people that uh, presented this alternative module called Package Builder that seems to compete with the features module but does things a little more simply. Um, it's unclear whether this module is going to gain any traction or not because people who do features don't like it very much. But the people who do this module, the Package Builder module, doesn't don't like features very much. So. Uh, uh, it's very unclear where that's going to go. Um, <clears throat> those are just the, the high-level things that I've, I got out of this. Uh, again, the overall message is there's no clean solution yet. Ken, any modules kind of stand out for you that you well, learned about? Or? Uh, the, the module that impressed me the most and that I had the most interest in was the, uh, the media module. And one of the things I noticed at DrupalCon, especially this year, that, that happens when you're moving from one version of Drupal to another, is that most of these add-on modules that have been developed to work with Drupal are there to solve some type of problem, uh, a limitation that Drupal has, or a, a certain way that Drupal approaches a problem. If there's a, 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 if people have issues with that, then they'll write a module to affect that. What happens, though, when you go from, let's say, Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, the way that Drupal 7 now handles a lot of their database objects and entities is changing. And so some of the modules that used to be the best solutions in Drupal 6 for doing something are now being deprecated by new modules that are sort of taking advantage of these new features in Drupal 7. The media module is a perfect example of that, and I was very excited to see this because, to me, one of the biggest problems in Drupal for years has been the handling of media, images, video, audio, uh, any, any of the other media entities that you might have out there. There are maybe 100 or 150 modules that have been written to handle media in different ways and to take let's say, an image and place it in your content in a WYSIWYG. So one of the exciting things that's happened in Drupal 7 as a result of this embedding the fields API inside of 
Drupal core rather than using CCK is it sort of opened up a completely new way of handling media. And so uh, there's a, a pretty substantial team of people working on the media module. And basically, it's supposed to be the do-all module for handling media. It's basically going to replace all of these other media modules that people have brought out over the years. And uh, this wouldn't even be possible to do in Drupal 6. The way the media module works is they basically, it looks at all media as being an entity. And in Drupal 7, you, they have now what they call stream wrappers, uh, which are basically APIs so that if you have an image or video coming in from a certain location, you can write a wrapper around that media entity and define, well, where is this piece of media coming from? Is it going to be on my local server? Or is it going to be on a remote server? Is that piece of media going to be coming from a content delivery network? And so the you can custom write these wrappers and put them around there. Then the media module will handle all of these different pieces of media all in the same way. You'll be able to embed that media through your WYSIWYG module all in the same way. And it just sort of gives you that universal solution to getting your media where you want it on the page. Is, is this somehow where um, <coughs> there, in one of the previous meetings, uh, the, uh, the was it phase two where Acquia people were when they were talking about uh, um, Apture? Yes. So, so, sort of is, is a different way to handle that. Does it make it com more compatible yeah. with tools like Apture? And for instance, one of the problems is right now the way Drupal's file system is set up at 6 is if you want to upload an image or a video from your local computer, you're going to upload that to the files directory uh, on your server, and it's going to reside there. Uh, but of course, one of the things you want to do to increase the performance of your Drupal website is, if you can, offload your images and video to a, a different server. Uh, that's where content <coughs> delivery networks came about. As you move that media elsewhere, it puts less demand on your server. Now your server only has to serve up web pages and not images. Well, right now in Drupal 6, it's the core of Drupal 6 is designed to look for those entities on your local machine. With this media module in Drupal 7, it's not going to care now where that media is coming from. You can write a wrapper around an image that will go out and grab that image from Flickr and bring it in. Or you can write a wrapper to pull it in from Photobucket or from Amazon or wherever. And that way, what the user sees is one universal interface, but you can be having this media coming from a lot of different places all at one time. And that sort of solves some of what Apture does. Apture was a, sort of a way to embed different types of media into your page. But now this is sort of going to become part of Drupal core, and that really opens up an awful lot of possibilities for handling images. I know in my case, I would like to be able to put images on Flickr. If someone goes to Flickr and <laughs> finds an image from my website, it'll link back to my website and that may draw more traffic to my page. Right now, it's really hard to integrate images from other places in, in the proper manner. Now, there'll be one file browser that'll pop up when you want to uh, place an image or a video or whatever in your content and it will grab all of these bits of media objects from wherever they come from and present them to the user all in one place. So for the, the users that are putting content in the system, it's going to be a lot more universal and, and simple than it used to be. And all the work now is going to be done on the back end of the media. And so I, if, in fact, I would recommend anyone to go out and take a look at the video media modules was pretty pretty fantastic. I got pretty excited watching it. Bill, how about you? Anything kind of jump out? Yeah. Um, there were a few modules that, that jumped out for me. Um, most impressive 
well, one of the most impressive was the uh, Search Lucene API module. I was, I was, after that session was over, I was kind of disappointed because the, the room was half empty at the time. But um, I find it an extremely important module. How many, have a show of hands, so who's familiar with uh, Apache Solar Search? That's maybe 10% of the room. Um, for, for, those, for those of you who are not familiar with Apache Solar, think of existing Drupal search out of the box. It's pretty primitive. It'll get the job done, but it doesn't give you a lot of deep, rich search functionality. It won't give you faceted search. It won't give you easy sorting, easy prioritizing of search results, those sorts of things. So um, as an answer to that, um, Apia and and others in the open source community came up with a solution that uses uh, Apache Solar as a completely separate web service that typically exists outside of the Drupal site on some other server, um, such that that other server indexes the Drupal database, and Drupal and this external server talk to one another via web services. With that solution, you get all that stuff. You get faceted search a la Amazon.com drill down. Um, you get prioritization of search results. You get a, a host of other deep search features. The disadvantage to Apache Solar, though, is that it's quite complex to set up. You have to set up a separate server, and you have to do a lot of pretty tricky configuration to make it work and hum. So um, one of one of the new answers presented at DrupalCon was a compromise solution, and that's the Search Lucene API module. It does sorry, what's Search Lucene, L-U-C-E-N-E, -E 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 API. L-U-C-E-R. There's no R. It's Lucene. Yeah. All right. Um, it exists as a, a fully downloadable plugin module for Drupal only. So you get most of that rich Apache Solar functionality now completely on your Drupal server. Way easier to um, implement, to configure. Um, you'd be up in a couple minutes having deep, rich search. So seven kind of, kind of or seven. Drupal 7, kind of an unsung module, um, or at least an, an unsung presentation there. But it may be available for Drupal 6 as well. Oh, yeah, okay. I think it's available for yeah. both. It's it did have server. It's just it just runs within PHP. Yeah, it runs within PHP. It does have one small disadvantage, and that is that a lot of the search uh, work is done in memory on your computer for speed, yeah. and so it has a little <coughs> bit of a limitation as to how much data it can do a, a search and index on. So if I remember correctly, because that, that, I was in that presentation as well, they said that Search Lucene works best if you have less than 7,000 7, nodes. So if you had a really, really large website where you were indexing an awful lot of content, um, it's a little bit limited. But for a smaller, simpler implementation where you want to get the kind of power that you can get from Apache Solar, and you don't have a huge amount of content, then Lucene's a perfect solution for that. And I think he said during the presentation that they were working on eliminating some of the, the size constraints as well. But I know that a lot of the search work is done in memory, so there's a limitation as to how much content can be indexed for that reason. Mm -hmm. I think there's a Google Summer code project to rewrite the search module in core for Drupal 82. Excellent. Which would be good. Again, search is another one of those things that drags down the performance of the Drupal website very quickly. Um, so a couple other modules. Um, uh, there were two different uh, talks on uh, iPhone development uh, with Drupal, uh, one of which dealt with um, a, a series of modules that interface directly with Objective-C. Um, uh, those modules were written by a fellow named Kyle Browning. He's looking for volunteers to help him finish <coughs> out this suite of modules. Um, but uh, four modules so far, KB Drupal Views, KB Drupal Node, KB Drupal User, and KB Drupal Search. Those used together with the services module 
provide a web services interface to retrieve or uh, create, update or delete views, nodes, users, and then use search, all via Objective C. Um, so what's what he has left to go is uh, Drupal file, menu, comment, and taxonomy. <coughs> so that's the plan. So I've got, that will probably be done over the next few months. So that's that's. Objective, that's, Objective C you're saying is now running on your iPhone and just connect directly to Drupal and correct. So you can manage Drupal from your iPhone. Right. Well, yeah. a lot more than that. You could power an iPhone app with Drupal. <coughs> so it's you not only. Uh, the other the other talk was pretty much the same principle that is having Drupal use web services to talk to um, an iPhone, but the object in this other talk the Objective C was generated using Titanium. Um, so there were two very very similar talks. Um, another thing that really impressed me it's not a module but a theme, and that is the Fusion theme. Um, have a show of hands, because I think Fusion works for six, right? Uh, yes. Right. Show of hands are people who are familiar with the Fusion theme. Okay, that's about 30% of you. Um, so first, I, I really got a good look at it. Um, it is a starter theme, much like Zen, but think, think of it as a next evolutionary step from the Zen theme. It couples very tightly with the Skinner module that will allow you to <coughs> set and create CSS values uh, all through uh, an administrative GUI. Um, the Fusion theme is grid-based, and so it <coughs> gives you a lot out of the box, uh, but also a lot of flexibility for you to configure without having to write any CSS code directly. Um, after that talk, I went up to the, the, the lecturer and I asked, I asked her, at, at this point in time now, is there any reason why we would need to start a theme from scratch anymore? Um, and her answer was, in most cases now, the answer is no. You could you could either start with Zen or something, which is the next step, like Fusion, to, to give yourself a much bigger head start. Um, would you explain why this says Fusion themes available? Prosper, Marina, Slate, Abstract, Caledon, Fantastic. I mean, I thought you meant it was one on theme. Yeah. Yeah, the, the power of the Fusion theme is that it makes it easy to build sub-themes. And a sub-theme, basically, you just go in and change the parts of the theme <coughs> that you want to customize. And yet, it still uses, basically, the engine of the Fusion theme to run most everything. The sub-theme is basically just uh, stylistic changes and changes that you want to make. So there are a lot of uh, uh, other themes that are based on the Fusion theme, but they're sub-themes. Okay. So, so you basically Aquia install Prosper the Fusion. A Aquia sub -theme. Prosper is a sub-theme of the Fusion theme. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a website right now using the Aquia Prosper sub-theme. So in that case, you have to have both themes um, installed. But it also simplifies things, because now you're not having to go back to the Fusion theme and Try to figure out all the stuff that the Fusion theme's doing. You just look at, you just concentrate on the, the changes that you want to make in your sub theme. Um, I did want to mention too uh, on Titanium that you mentioned for the iPhone. <coughs> the interesting thing about Titanium, it's a, it's an application development environment uh, that is open source. In fact, it's um, produced by a company called Accelerator, which is one of our old. Friends, I've forgotten his name here from Atlanta. Jeff Haney, Jeff Haney started it. Uh, what's exciting to me about it is the iPhone requires Objective C to build iPhone apps, and Android phones require Java. Uh, what the what Titanium does is it allows people who already have knowledge of using JavaScript to write JavaScript applications, and then it goes out and translates that JavaScript application into both an Objective-C application and a Java application. So you can build one phone app, smartphone application that will run on both environments simultaneously. And it has a little phone emulator so that as you're building your application, it pulls up a, 
or approximation of the phone, and you can actually test the behavior of your application right on your computer without a actually having to download it to a phone. So I was very impressed. If it does everything that he says it does, it, it looks very exciting. One of the other kind of um, issues that was getting a lot of buzz, Teresa actually alluded to it in his keynote, was um, the fact that Drupal's the only CMS where you can build distributions on top of Drupal. Is everyone familiar with like what a Drupal distribution is? There's about 19, 20 <coughs> distributions now. Basically a distribution is a, a package of modules that are tailored towards a specific industry, a specific vertical to solve a a business problem. And it, we had a couple presentations earlier in the year about Open Publish. It uh, um, was created to uh, help the publishing <coughs> industry, and they basically have uh, packaged together a recipe of modules to address the, the publishing sector. Um, Harvard announced at, I think it was RubelCon, Open Scholar. And um, Open, Open Scholar. Scholar. There's, yeah, there's a ton of. Um, it's one of the takeaways that I had. There's just a, a ton of interest. There always has been, but I was just really shocked at how many universities were there at um, at DrupalCon. So Open Scholar is basically, you know, take Kennesaw State as an example. <coughs> Kennesaw State has 30 different departments within the university. They have created um, what common features you would find on any kind of uh, university department website and package those together into one install profile. So what Acquia is now doing um, is providing commercial support around distributions. And there's always been a little bit of a um, debate whether Drupal should um, you know, view distributions as kind of um, competition, is it taking away you know, resources to work on um, you know, newer releases and other modules, but <coughs> basically Dries' position was he sees it as a good thing. He sees it as one of the real differentiators um, you know, within the community. Um, phase 2, who actually came down and did one of the meetups, also announced at DrupalCon that they're coming out with OpenGov. Um, open public. Open, open public, which is tailored towards um, uh, government websites. So open public is the name of that distro. Um, and that's pretty exciting because um, everybody probably knows by now whitehouse.gov um, is on Drupal and um, the current kind of administration has indicated a real openness and transparency to um, the government websites and, and Drupal kind of is, is seen as being a really good fit for the types of sites that are being developed in the government. So, um, anything else you guys can? Well, I add to uh, along that line, I, it's been my feeling that these distributions are really not competition for developers because I don't think distributions simplify building of a website because you're actually talking about taking Drupal <coughs> and adding more stuff on top of it. So distributions generally I find to be more complex to learn and to manage. But what they do do is they provide sort of a best practices approach to that particular kind of website. So I think distributions are actually going to help Drupal developers to build a larger consulting business. Because uh, if you think learning Drupal core is hard, wait till you try to learn <coughs> Open Publish or Open Atrium. There's so much more in there to sort of confuse you right up front. So I think people using distributions will be able to build websites faster, but they're going to need more help from developers in order to do that. So I think it's really going to help to bolster the, the development market for Drupal. Today, haven't, open, haven't the distributions also been very much tied to a certain look? <clears throat> it's not so easy to switch open atrium to look different than what you get out of the box. I, or open part of that, I think, is just the uh, programming approach they've used. I think as they get a little bit smarter with 
distributions that they'll it'll be easier to theme because I, I think that's one of the main weaknesses most of the distributions aim for a very strong look I don't know if this is the right time to bring this up but the thought struck me that when we do our Drupal con <coughs> would we be interested in doing some tracks where people do open publish all day because that's what they're interested in could be, you know. Um, I think when you go to a camp, one of the things we learned at DrupalCon, as I went to the open publish training, uh, they had a little bit of difficulty at first filling that class up because you've got all you got all these nice, pretty ornaments all scattered around in all these sessions. You don't want to take all your time and just look at one subject at a time. So I think that's more of the a, a class for that is more of something that you would do later as a dedicated class rather than as a, a Drupal camp kind of thing. Although some of the, I don't know, some of the classes they taught at uh, Drupal time were. Well, I mean, two or, two or three back to back that are in an orderly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, one of the other kind of um, key points that, that Dries brought up, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but you kind of uh, emphasize that Drupal's reaching sort of this inflection point when it comes to innovation and that there's kind of new threats on the horizon, if you will. And um, it's interesting, he actually put out a blog post this morning about uh, you know, Joomla and what's been going on in that community. But um, the WordPress is about to come out with its latest release. And for the longest time, WordPress, Joomla, and kind of Drupal have always kind of played well together. If you needed a blogging or a microsite, WordPress is your answer. If you needed something a little bit more advanced, smaller to mid-sized site, Joomla. And Drupal has always been seen as being the most kind of um, enterprise ready, uh, the most flexible, the most you know, the module framework makes it easier to scale. So um, he's saying though that be careful because the gap is kind of um, slowly narrowing and did you guys pick up on anything with what's kind of going on in WordPress I guess is introducing content types and some other some other things that are going to be kind of potentially well I read that post this morning that I found sort of interesting because one of the things he's really said is that Joomla is sort of moving toward Drupal right but at the same time, Drupal's moving toward Joomla because you could sort of say that Drupal Gardens is WordPress.com or a, a Joomla. So yeah, it's like everyone's encroaching into each other's territory more now than they did in the past. Uh, I don't really know how that's going to flesh out in the future. Interesting stat. Just does anybody know of all the websites in the world what percentage are Drupal sites? You have an interesting stat on that. It's actually it's actually like right around one percent. Um, does anybody know like how many WordPress sites there are? How many are built? Without seeing the keynote? Yeah, eight and a half. Yeah. Eight and a half percent. Wow. And Joomla, what was it, slightly over one? It was still, yeah. still above Drupal. Still above Drupal. Yeah. Yeah. So that was pretty interesting that um, there's still a lot of obvious upside and kind of market share to be gained. Yeah, go ahead. Um, does this... oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I had a question. Was anything at this year's DrupalCon uh, related to any further work in sort of content ingest or content migration or you know the, the whole uh, importing of content from legacy? Like, let's say folks want to transition away from a commercial CMS to an open source CMS. I, I, Are there any content migration toolings that came up that were more advanced? I can't. Do you guys remember? I can't remember specifically, but I know that was mentioned in several sessions that um, that they they're really working on a migrate style module to make it easier to, to migrate content uh, that will handle a lot of that, uh, perhaps easier in Drupal 7, because now Drupal 7, because it can tie back to other databases, uh, makes it more appropriate. <coughs> that's that another area, I think, for 
for the you know for Drupal as a platform to compete against. You know, we're talking about how it's it's competing with other open source based platforms, but to compete on the enterprise side too with the you know the, the open text slash vignettes of the world or yeah. Yeah, however, that's all that that integration that's happening, or you know, the whole consolidation that's happening on the, on the commercial side. Migration tools are going to be a key element to any Drupal developer or consulting practice to to be able to go sell Drupal against some of that other stuff. Too. Did you guys hear any more about that? Well, I didn't attend any talks on that. Yeah. I don't know if there were any offered, but there are for Drupal six right now a, a bunch of modules. That are actually quite, quite excellent um, yeah. at uh, migration, backup, import. For my current project, for example, I'm using a module called it's either import or data import. I forget which, but that'll import content <laughs> from the spreadsheet. Is it node and, uh, could be node import. That's where we're using the Stealth migration. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Great. It'll yeah. content. It'll it'll import content cool. from a spreadsheet or a CSV yeah. and turn it into Drupal nodes. Unbelievable. Yeah, the, the, the migrate the migrate module is another yeah. one that you want to check out. Yes. In the end, if you just hire a rock star coder, he can usually get it done. For you. <laughs> uh, once Views three comes out and it has the ability to use anything as a backend, not just your database, you'll be able to pull in data literally from anywhere. And especially with the feeds module, which can take any kind of data and transform it however you want. Um, but there's also a Google Summer of Code project to kind of make the interaction between feeds and the near views back end easier. Um, it's going to become very, very simple to import or export anything you want. Yeah, that did remind me. That I know the feeds module is another one. But they realize that aggregating RSS feeds from the internet is very similar to importing data. And so when they Feed API used to be the aggregator module in six, in the last year. The feeds module is supposed to not only bring in RSS feeds, but they're opening that interface up to make it sort of an import module as well. And then there's another module that goes with it called view, view feeds or something, that'll take a view and turn it into a feed import or something. Uh, I think the idea is um, right now <coughs> feeds takes some kind of input stream and usually turns it into nodes. And now that views can do anything as a backend, um, the idea is to let feeds uh, basically turn the input stream into a backend for views without going through nodes. Yeah. So it's going to make your site lighter and faster and Simplify everything. That's not ready yet. Barbara? Oh, does CSS5 fit into all of this? CSS3. Uh, is there a 5? HTML5 and CSS3. Right. How does it fit into what? <laughs> Drupal. <laughs> um, there, actually, there was a presentation on CSS3, a session um, there, and I went to that one. Um, CSS3 looks pretty interesting. Uh, that's a theming. That's a theming topic, and uh, it's not specific to Drupal. But um, there are there are extra theming opportunities available in CSS3 to simplify a lot of the stuff that designers do with CSS that can be a real pain. HTML5, on the other hand, I don't really know very much. Can, do you guys know much about? I know it's uh, it's going to be a video alternative to Flash. It offers new tags, new HTML tags, and one of them is a tag that lets you embed video without having to use Flash. You can actually specify your video encoding. Uh, I cannot remember the other tag. I think there's a font face tag or something like that. It's got local data storage and then local databases too. So you can do like offline data, especially for like handhelds and things like that. We just connect it and just sync up with the server. There's a lot of cool stuff that you can do And then it, it's tied into Smile, which is a, it has a timeline in it for multimedia, for movements. And just like Flash had a timeline engine in it, so you could do the same thing in HTML5. It's actually retroing Smile, which was like, let's go back to 1998. Mm -hmm. for, 
simple multimedia is <coughs> pulling that in. So it's like Tim Berners Lee is just going back into the archives of web standards and picking up stuff out of the closet. So that's really cool stuff. Smile. And, um, and that's that's really where the that combined with the video encoding support is really the the quote unquote flash. Flash, flash killer, whatever, flash, flash killer. Yeah. And that's going to be uh, one of the focuses of Google 8, too. There's a Google Summer of Code project to uh, kind of be the precursor to what's going to be Drupal 8 for Drupal 7 um, for the media module specifically. It's going to help the media module display things using the native HTML5 tags um, as a way moving forward to get that into Drupal Core in 8. So you just enter that with the body? Uh, you just enter that in the body on a page? In yes. HTML5, yeah. Yeah, tags HTML5. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter because I6 will never, ever die. <laughs> well, that, well, you know, that, that was an interesting thing about CSS3 because, um, you know, all, all the different browser makers implement CSS3 in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of an interesting situation because uh, if if your browser supports CSS3 entities, it'll do them, but if your browser doesn't support them, it ignores them. So the idea is to sort of give up on this concept that your web page has to look exactly the same way mm -hmm. in every browser. So the idea is that your site's going to look plain and ordinary in IE6. It's going to look fantastic and, you know, super... Yeah. Califragilistic in uh, mm -hmm. you know Opera or, or Chrome. That's so, easy to say unless your client is exactly <laughs> using yes. your site on IE6. And, and trying to yeah, that. trying to come up to a with a site that degrades nicely back to IE6. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was funny the uh, the guy who manned the Microsoft booth at the uh, at DrupalCon. Microsoft definitely like saying earlier they had a big presence, they had an open bar one night, they were really catering to like the whole Drupal community. He does this wrap up post. And he's like, I didn't know what to expect, if people are gonna be booing me, you know, throwing stuff at me and and he said the big one takeaway he had was that all people all people want in the Drupal community is for them to fix IE6. <laughs> so he's like, he's like, That's the, that was the overriding theme that you know he came back with. It was like everybody was really warm and welcoming and helpful, but yeah. what I don't understand is why well, Microsoft is can't just automatically deprecate IE6 by putting in IE8 or 9 in their automatic updates. So the next time you it's update done, XP, you do your automatic updates in XP and it goes that yeah. are stuck on IE6 is corporate. It's not, yeah. it's not Microsoft. Internet app Actually, there's one enlightening it. piece that I got from the Georgia State government. They still have computers running Windows 2000. <laughs> and Windows 2000 cannot run anything higher than IE6. Uh, okay. There's your, there's your answer. State University. This is Georgia State government, yeah. uh, <laughs> the Department of Natural Resources. <laughs> Um, Our tax dollars not at work. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, I heard a couple. There's a couple new folks here who are kind of just getting involved with Drupal. What would you guys kind of recommend for them to, to just to start to kind of get their? They want to start kind of get immersed or learn about Drupal, and, and where would you suggest they get started? Really depends on your background. Um, I'm a developer, and so I, you know, come from a, you know, I started my career in, in X Windows and C. Uh, so I started by learning how Drupal development works by buying a book called Pro Drupal Development. I realized that is not going to work for people who aren't necessarily developers. So I'm, I'm actually going to defer. Maybe I think Kent may be able to be most identified. <laughs> not, not, well, I don't, why? I don't, is that because I'm the ultimate? The, the ultimate well, beginner? Well, no, because you have become an advanced user in Drupal yes. without being a developer. Well, I was, I was thinking about that today, and I'm almost to that point to where if a beginner who's just starting to learn Drupal, uh, depending on how good you are uh, with programming languages, I would say the first thing to do is determine how, how many months you think it's going to take you to get comfortable with Drupal. If it's going to be more than two months, 
then I would suggest that you start your Drupal learning cycle with Drupal 7 and skip Drupal 6. Maybe in another month, maybe in another month to a month and a half, uh, on the theory that it's going to take you two to four months to really become conversant and comfortable with Drupal. So do you want to become comfortable and converse in Drupal 6 and then immediately be hit with becoming conversant and comfortable with Drupal 7? I'm not sure I would say that as of today, but maybe in about a month or so, because Drupal 7 is getting so close, that might be one way to, to keep from getting overload, because a lot of the things in Drupal 7 are going to be done very differently than they're done in Drupal 6. And so um, that would be my recommendation is to start playing and with, with uh, Drupal Gardens. Um, if you are going to go down the Drupal 6 track, um, I would recommend a couple things uh, if you're getting started. Uh, one is uh, drupal.org slash handbook. And that will take you to a list of documentation, uh, getting started guide, uh, getting started with administration, getting started with uh, module configuration, uh, some very basic tutorials. I would also recommend a book by the folks at Lullabot called Understanding Drupal. Yeah, uh, using, Drupal. using Drupal. That's a, an O'Reilly book. Um, that <coughs> it requires no coding. Uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, some very commonly used modules and how to install and configure them. You can get an enormous amount accomplished with just that one book. Um, the third thing is um, that same company, Lullabot, um, which is the premier training uh, organization with Drupal, although there are many great ones. Uh, they also came out with a, a DVD series uh, for learning Drupal, and um, uh, that DVD series is excellent, so you can check that out too. And then one final thing, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just second what Paul said. If you're a developer, um, you must, must get the Pro Drupal Development Yes. Book. Do not pass go. Just get that book. And um, it will, we learned that uh, at DrupalCon that it will be updated for Drupal 7. Um, I haven't looked at them myself, but I understand there's also some excellent Drupal training videos on lynda.com. Yeah. And finally, show up to the Drupal workshops that we hold on the third Tuesday of the month and ask a question. Okay, you're, you're probably trying to accomplish something specific with Drupal. Ask around. Ask people in this group, you know, I'm trying to do X. How would you get started doing X? Uh, and this is kind of a, a you know, shameless plug, but I was telling these guys earlier before the meeting, we're very fortunate to have a very active local community. Um, Atlanta on meetup.com has number nine in the world for um, Drupal memberships now, so with Drupal members on Meetup. So um, a lot of places don't have <coughs> presentations like these, the second Tuesday, workshops, the third Tuesday, camps, um, you know, there's seminars now that are teaching beginner tri Drupal classes in Atlanta, so if you want to get involved, there's, there's definitely lots of opportunities um, for people at, you know, all levels, so. Um, I'm curious too, how many people in here are working with Drupal in a Linux environment? How many in a Windows environment? How many in a Mac environment? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So Windows still rules. Yeah, right? and it kind of proves Paul's point earlier. We were talking about one of our upcoming um, presentations should be on setting up a, a Drupal dev environment, and Paul was like, that involves three different speakers because there's so much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I will just confuse the heck out of because I'm going to recommend setting up both a Windows and a Linux environment simultaneously. <laughs> well, there are good alternatives out there. If you don't want to spend the time going through that, I recently learned about WebEnabled.com, and yes. uh, you can you can set up two environments for free. Um, and for nine bucks, you can go up to five, and has backup and restore and cloning and uh, exporting into your regular hosting. So there's also Drupal Gardens and Buzzer. And you can use ZZR. Uh, Buzzer was actually announced at DrupalCon. Um, 
but uh, they're both hosted versions of Drupal. Uh, I think they're both in beta right now, and you may need an invite code to use them. I'm yeah. I'm wondering is Drupal Garden still invite only or right? I don't think it, it is. is. They were handing out invites at DrupalCon. And if you okay. put your email there, so it'll take a couple of days. I've, I've been waiting for right. more than that, and nothing comes back. Isaac, <laughs> yes. Uh, what I was going to say is mostly been mentioned, but yeah, if you're interested in Drupal 7, for sure, go home tonight, sign up for Drupal Garden. It's, it's really easy to set up. It takes about five minutes, and you'll get to see what Drupal 7 is like right away. Web enabled also um, is great for uh, a development environment especially, but also it lets you set up um, not just Drupal, but Joomla, WordPress, anything else if you want to compare it. Uh, it lets you set up both Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. Um, and then I forgot about Buzzer, but uh, thank you for reminding me, because that's great too. I looked at that uh, the week of DrupalCon, and it's similar to Drupal Gardens. It's a little bit more configuration than Drupal Gardens, but um, it's also a little more flexible. It lets you take more control. So if that's what you're interested in, definitely take a look at this. Oh, well, I might be really blasphemous in suggesting another thing. How many, <laughs> and I'm just going to mention it briefly, how many people in here work with Dreamweaver? Okay, then I'm not going to mention it. <laughs> we only have two people. Um, I, I have been playing around with the new version of Dreamweaver, which has Drupal support out of the box. And for someone who's learning Drupal and who's used to a WYSIWYG environment, uh, this might be an excellent training tool because it pulls all of the Drupal modules, CSS files, HTML templates, everything into Dreamweaver now with a live view so that you can now see how all the modules are interrelated to one another. And as you click on elements on a page, it will direct you to the file in Drupal that is controlling that particular <coughs> part of the element. So for someone who's trying to understand how CSS and HTML and PHP all relate to one another, this may be a very good shortcut for people. I've been really excited looking at it the last two days. We're kind of getting up against it on time. Did any of you guys see, and this is definitely a recommendation, There's a, there was a keynote done by Tim O'Reilly. Tim O'Reilly does a lot. He's a major publisher, big open source evangelist. He kind of did like this futurist kind of type presentation. Um, very, very insightful. I mean, if you guys get a chance to catch the video from that, um, to watch it. It was excellent. Um, what did you guys kind of come away with it on any kind of thoughts on his talk? I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I heard his talk. <laughs> that was, that was, that was it information was thing. Yeah. I thought that the, yeah. the, the fragment of memory I have of that one was 40% um, of the web will be accessed through handheld devices by the year 2013. 40% of the web. And, and so um, he was encouraging innovation in, in that area. In, in fact, I was going to say, I don't remember hardly anything he said in his presentation, but I remember when I was listening to him, noting how every single person in the audience was working on a computer of some type. It was either an iPad or an iPhone or a computer. When they were asking the presenters questions, they were getting people in the audience to tweet questions to a site, and then they were reading the questions live up on the screen, and it just hit me how totally connected everything is becoming now. That really, to me, is the future. Yeah. The other piece that I got out of that keynote, he kind of raised a question, or a caution, I guess, about how you know we've got all our data out there and it's supposedly open, but is it really? Who who is controlling that open data? And I thought of that again. I went to the F8 Facebook Developer Conference the next day, where they announced all their open graph <laughs> APIs, uh, where they will own all your open data, and uh, 
it made me think about that caution. And, and are there, you know, we, we may need to try and find open, really, truly open ways to compete with the likes of Facebook, who will openly control all our data for us. Mm -hmm. he, he quoted William Gibson, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Uh, and so what he does is... You were listening. Um, he says he watches the alpha geeks. He watches the people who are early adapters in area and didn't really give a logical reason for who he selects, but other than his gut feel, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I listened to a... He gave a, uh, he gave a talk, an hour-long talk today, a webinar um, from from San Francisco on uh, Gov 2.0. What is Gov 2.0? Which he's really involved with. He's yeah. basically the godfather of Web 2.0. So, yeah. It's a funny you kind of copyright that term, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It, right. Ignore him at your own risk, I say. <laughs> the sidebar of that is like they were, <laughs> there were some chuckles because he was, he was giving like this passionate speech on, you know, open gov and transparency and, you know, what everybody's getting budgets out there and just openness within government and no one really reacted in the crowd and then the White House guy um, got up and said we're giving we're contributing four modules back to the community and everybody like stood up and yelled and like, cheered and like it was like they were like a rock star when they made that announcement yet yeah, like open gov and the new wave of you know, how we're going to be administered um, and yeah, the the other keynote was, was good as good too. I mean, the, the guy I was shocked at how he must have been 25 years old. Who was the uh, director of new media for the White House, and he was the one who led that project. And um, he's the one who they made the announcement there that the White House was contributing you know, four modules that they used on the project back to Drupal. So um, that was pretty cool. And they did a press release, um, you know, around that. And, Kind of showed how the White House is leveraging Drupal on you know, uh, State of the Union video feeds, um, you know, <coughs> blogging how during the um, healthcare reform debate, how um, it, it was the most traffic and most visited site in the world um, during that time, and how they scaled Drupal to accommodate you know that amount of traffic. Um, it, was, it was really interesting, and his that video is available too. Um, any closing thoughts that you want to, anything we didn't cover? I would say that 90% of the advanced Drupal leases are Mac users. And that's a lot that of Macs in there. Huge lot of Macs, yeah, I was. I'm still holding out. <laughs> <laughs> any questions anybody has? Does everybody know where to go find the videos? Archive.org? Yeah, archive.org, or you can actually go directly to the DrupalCon site, which is sf2010.drupal.org, um, and go to the conference schedule, and then you know find the sessions you want. And with each session, the videos are linked to those sessions now. Uh, does anyone know if the archive.org site has higher resolution videos, or are they the same videos? I believe it's the same videos. Same videos. Uh, just a miscellaneous um, detail there. Just as there were a couple of presentations emphasizing uh, handheld mobile development with Drupal, there were also uh, there was also a session on Facebook apps powered by Drupal. Check that one out too, um, because it shows how you could integrate Drupal in the body of the you know, Facebook site itself, but it also shows you how you can take your Drupal site and embed Facebook elements in it. So uh, that's a big one too. Well, thanks, everybody. We'll uh, be back next month, uh, second Tuesday, back at Matrix here on a new uh, presentation. Thanks, thanks for the panel. Yeah.